poor and needy. And that's all of us, right? Amen. All of us. Yeah.
Amen. Today's scripture reading will be coming from Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 7. Stand with me, if you will, for the reading of scripture together. Now, we started that last week. We want to continue to do that. Reading the scripture together in concert. Chapter 5, verse 1. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on all those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Oh, precious Lord, how grateful we are for the privilege of worshiping your name in song, worshiping your name with your word. And we thank you for drawing us to you to become your children, to become men and women whose lives are dedicated and sold out to Jesus. Father, would you speak to our hearts this morning? Would you draw us into your word? Lord, every one of us has 4,000 things going on. Would you clear our minds of all of that stuff? And Lord, let us focus on your word today. Let us hear from you. Let us learn from you. Speak to our hearts, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So delighted to see you this morning. I'm excited you're here. I'm excited about what God has, uh, has in his word to share with us this morning. Now last week we, we, uh, we talked about the... Uh, the, the sins of uh, God said in, in verses 31 and 32 of chapter 4, get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has done for you. All right? And so... He goes directly into then be imitators of God. We, got, we have to remember, we have to remember this is a letter. This is not a book with chapters, right? Paul wrote this as a letter. And while it, having it divided into chapters and verses makes it easier for us to find where we're, where we're reading, where we're studying today, it, it breaks the thoughts, right? It disjoins the thoughts. And so, uh, when, when we read it without the chapter breaks, it reads more like a letter. And so Paul, uh, with, with this running start into chapter 3, Paul, Paul starts off challenging the Gentiles. He takes a break that's about that long and hits it again. He, this is important. 
This is important. I need you to understand what I'm saying. And so he calls us uh, to, to do away with all the anger and the wrath and all of that. And then to be tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Just as, you know, most of us learned that verse along about this height, didn't we? Just along about this height. And so that's, that's, one of those, that's one of those foundational verses that we have grown up with, but we don't outgrow, right? We don't outgrow God's Word. And so Paul says, be an imitator of God. Now the, the Greek word there is mimitos, mimitos. And it means to be a mirror image. All right, and you've seen the you've seen the the mimes. That's the first four letter M I, first four letters M I M E. You've seen the mimes when they're they're feeling this box and all of this. Or they will there there will be two of them, and they'll be face to face, and they are mirror imaging everything that the other guy's doing. And that's always just fascinating. That's what God tells us to do. This is why God says he wants us to, to meet him daily, face to face, so that we can see what God has planned for our lives today. We know what he did yesterday. We know what we're praying that he does tomorrow. We don't have to worry about yesterday. That's in the past. We don't have to worry about tomorrow because tomorrow is not promised to us. But today, today we need to meet God face to face so that we can mimitize, we can mime Him and we can act just as He's, as he's telling us. Now, <clears throat> granted, we can't, we can't imitate God in his all power. We can't imitate God in his all knowing. Right? We can't imitate God in his all presence. But we can imitate God in his self sacrifice. We can imitate God in his forgiving spirit. And so God calls us to imitate him in the areas that we can. The areas that he has, he has uh, given us his Holy Spirit's power to imitate and mimic him. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, so Paul had said, back in chapter 4, he said, uh, learn about Christ. And he had said, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to say, mimic God. Mimic God. Imitate God. Now, similar to what we talked last week, where Paul had said, put off the old man, put this off, take on this. Put this off, take on this. Right? And then as he shifts gears, he changes paragraphs in his letter and he shifts gears just a little bit, uh, a little bit, and he says, let me show you some contrasts. Some contrasts that they're totally in opposition to one another. But it's a little bit different format than the take off and put on. Same principle though. So the first contrast, we're going to look at four different contrasts this morning very briefly. First contrast is love versus lust. Love versus lust. Now, <clears throat> chapter 2, he says, live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice of God. 
the, the live a life of love, that's agape love. That's the love that we're incapable of living. That's the love that only God can give us only when we trust Him as our Savior. <clears throat> it's the love that we are incapable of having. It's a love that we're incapable of receiving until Jesus lives inside of us. And that's when, when Jesus is inside of us, His agape love loves through us. And this is why sometimes we say, the Jesus in me loves the Jesus in you. Right? Because I'm incapable of loving everybody. I'm incapable of loving some people. But because Jesus lives inside of me, through God's power, I can love even my enemies. And that's one of the things that Paul tells us. Uh, in, in another area. When we order our life and our behavior after this self-sacrificial agape love, agape will become the deciding factor in our lives. It will be the choice maker. We will, when, when, when we're living in God's agape love, we will put other people first. We will give up ourselves in order to help other people come to Jesus. Because that's what agape love does. That's what agape love does. And agape love will always overcome lust. Lust, lust is me wanting what I want right now. And lust can never be satisfied, Solomon told us. But love is me wanting what's best for you, not necessarily what's best for me. I want, I want you to be in first place. I want you to have the blessing, more so than I want the blessing. And that's, that's agape love, how Jesus how Jesus loved us. The, the Greek right here in this, in this verse is so very, very, very important because it says Christ loved us and the English says he gave himself up for us. He gave himself up for us. And that's great. Jesus did die for us. But that's not the most important thing. The Greek tells us not only did Jesus die for us, he died, Brother Ronnie, in place of us so that I don't have to die and go to hell for my sin. That's way bigger than him dying for me, right? He took my place. He was my substitute. This is... This is where we get the doctrine called substitutionary atonement. The, the blood of Jesus substitutionarily, there you go, we get enough syllables in there, substitutionarily atoned for, covered over my sins. Because I can't do it for myself. I can't do it for myself. Jesus died in my place. Now, when a coach puts in a substitute player, regardless of the sport, that substitute is playing in place of a substitute of the other player. If the substitute scores, he gets the glory, not the other guy, right? If the substitute causes a foul, he gets the blame. He gets the penalty. If the substitute breaks his leg on a play, it doesn't hurt the guy that he's substituting for. And that's what Jesus did for you and me. 
He is our substitute. Without that substitutionary death, us dying for our own sins would do nothing. That's what we deserve. But with Jesus' substitutionary death, we don't have to die for our sins. Jesus already did it. Praise God. Jesus Amen. already did it. But the substitute, the sacrifice for your sins, for my sin, had to be totally perfect, totally pure, and completely without blemish, without any sin. So, hammered that home a little bit, but that substitutionary atonement is so important for us to understand. And as we move on into verses 3 through 7, Paul seems to circle back around again and rename some of those sins of the flesh sins of the attitude with another charge, another, uh, another blow at avoiding those sins. But then he added as a verse, he says, don't even be partners with people who practice those sins. Look at verses three and four again. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity, or of greed, because these things are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, or foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. All of God's gifts, all of God's gifts, now James tells us, Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from heaven, from the Father of lights, right? So every good gift that God has given us, all of God's gifts, including our human sexuality, is a gift from God. Human sexuality inside the bonds of marriage is God's great gift. And Paul said, we should be thankful. It's not for foolish talking or telling dirty jokes. And yet, every good gift that God has given, Satan has taken and twisted and warped out of shape to where when Satan gets through with God's great gift, it's almost unrecognizable because his job, his goal is to kill, to steal, and to destroy everything that God has created. Now, God made us sexual beings for two purposes. Number one, for procreation. Procreation. For making babies. Why does God want us to make babies? So that we've got another generation to raise up as Christ followers and Christ servers, right? That's the reason God gave us children, so that we could raise them to honor Jesus the way that, that we have learned to honor Jesus. The second purpose that God gives us babies, uh, that God gave us uh, sexuality, is for recreation. It's highly pleasurable. It's highly pleasurable. If God had not intended our sexuality to be pleasurable, he wouldn't have included the Song of Solomon in the scriptures, right? But again, Satan has taken that and twisted it and warped it into all forms of deviance, all forms of wickedness that we see people marching, we see people parading, we see people demonstrating, and, you know, it just, it turns our stomach because 
They're going completely against God's word, completely against God's purpose. The filthy lusts of the flesh that Paul mentions here are the exact opposite from a life of love. They're pointing out a life of lust. A life of love leads us to righteousness, to holiness, to imitating God. These sins, these sexual sins, are driven and empowered by greed. Greed. How much is it? How much is enough? A little bit more. How much is enough? A little bit more. How much is too much? Well, I'm not there yet. Right? Well, Pastor, we, we don't really have a lot of problem with sexual sins right now. But he included in that list of sins, greed. Greed. Oh, wow. How often do we, so, you know, one of our buddies pulls up in a new car and we say, oh, wow, I would sure like a car like that one that's parked out there. Or one of our friends gets a new house and we're just going, oh, 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 what I would give to have a house like that. Be careful. Be careful because that greed can turn into an idol. Victory over these sins comes when we purpose in our hearts to please God by imitating Him. Mirror imaging God and then trusting His power, trusting His deliverance from these sins. Contrast number three. Holy words, holy words versus hollow words. Verse number five, Paul tells us, uh, for of this you can be sure. You can know, the King James says. Basically, he's saying you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt. You can be certain. No, uh, such a man is an idolater. No immoral impure or greedy person has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And so the immoral, the impure, the greedy have made idols out of those three topics. They've made idols out of those three subjects. And God says when when we have a sin that controls our life, it may not be listed in, in these verses right here. We've got, a, we've got a favorite sin that we just, you know, we just deal with over and over and over and over. We have to be very cautious, very careful that we don't make an idol out of that. Well, God, I did it again, but you know, I'm just human. I can't help it. Forgive me. And we just kind of laugh it off and go on. We have to be cautious because we can make an idol out of that. Well, God, you know, it. okay, we're good. No, no, we're not good. We need to overcome. We need to, God's strength to overcome through his power and through his deliverance. He goes on to say that these are holy words saying you can have an inheritance with God. You can have. Those are holy words. The hollow words, verse number six he says, let no one deceive you with empty words, with hollow words. King James says, vain words. Let nobody deceive you with those. Don't be deceived by empty, hollow words that don't have substance, they don't have value, they don't have any real meaning. They're hollow. And 
Because of these sins, he says, these heinous sins that he listed back in 31 and 32 of chapter 4 and then the uh, verses 3 and 4 there in, in, in chapter 5, because of these heinous sins that are listed above and the hollow teachings and the hollow lifestyles that they promote and the people who stand on in front of the TV cameras and say, it's okay, I'm proud to live this way. God made me this way. Don't blame that on God. God didn't make you that way. Satan helped you choose that way, but God didn't make you that way. It's a choice. And the lifestyles are promoted a lot of times by pastors in pulpits. And my brothers and sisters, just because a guy is a pastor in a pulpit does not necessarily mean that they are saved. Amen. There are lots of folks, I'm afraid, there are lots of folks standing in pulpits this morning teaching and preaching that all of this homosexuality and lesbianism and the plus, 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 plus is God-ordained and there's nothing wrong with it. They may hold this book like we've said before, but they're not holding to this book. Amen. And God, God will condemn those folks. They have, a, they have empty, hollow words. They have empty hearts that will be judged by God's wrath. And that's contrast number four. God's wrath versus God's want. God's wrath. Paul said in the end of verse number six, he said, well, let's just read the whole thing. Let no one deceive you with empty words, the hollow words. For because of these things, these, these sins, the uh, re rebellion against, rejection of God's word, because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient to his word. God's wrath is God's firm, ongoing opposition to all things evil. To all things evil. He is eternally opposed. God is eternally opposed to everything that is contrary to his word. His word doesn't change. His word doesn't change. God doesn't change. The word of the Lord stands forever. Amen. And it will never change. He's opposed to anything that is contrary to his design and his holy nature. God's wrath, his explosive anger, will fall on these men and women regardless of what they call themselves. God's explosive wrath will fall on people who continually disobey His commands, His words, and live a lifestyle in opposition to Him. Another holy word. Any guy, any girl, whatever they call themselves, can change, can come out of those lifestyles because God said, he who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Our job as Christians is number one, to stand against that impure, unholy, ungodly lifestyle. It's our job to be a witness against evil. Now that means that we can't, we can't paint our, put on clothes that's the same color as the wall and just blend in and hope they don't notice us. That won't work. That's not being a witness against. 
sinful behavior. That's also not being a witness for the Lord Jesus. That's not giving them any opportunity to trust Christ. That's not giving them any opportunity to hear, thus saith the Lord. That's our job, is to stand up and to stand out for Jesus. And then in verse 7, Paul says, Therefore, don't be partakers with them. So Paul offers contrasts. Love versus lust. Gratitude versus greed. Holy words versus hollow words. God's wrath versus God's want. Contrasts are given to offer choices. To offer choices. We all have a past. Paul had a past. But the key is the wonderful thing about it is our past is in the past. It's taken care of through the blood of Jesus. Regardless what we have done, <coughs> pardon, regardless what we haven't done, we can choose between God's wrath or we can choose God's want for our life. And scripture tells us over and over, God wants us to come to him as Savior and Lord. God wants us to come to him in repentance. One of the, one of the Bibles that I use, uh, that I study from, is called the Life and Recovery Bible. And I looked up these, uh, these verses this past week, uh, this here in chapter 5. And here, I want to read this to you because I can't quote it. All right? The life recovery verse uh, Bible says about these verses, we're to seek to rebuild our broken relationships. We're to avoid destructive and vile behavior. And we're to make amends as far as possible. This is why Paul, uh, Paul said, Inasmuch as within you, live at peace with all men. And ladies, there are some people we will never be able to make peace with. They're not after peace. They're not after friendship. They're not after love. They're not after God. But our job is to stand for Jesus, stand against their behavior, and help them understand there is a way out of all of these sexual sins, sexual deviancy. As difficult as imitating Christ might sound, anything is possible with God's help. Amen. Anything is possible with God's help. Our application says, contrasts are all about choices. Miss Katrina's going to lead us in an invitation song. I've decided to follow Jesus. That's a choice. In contrast to, in contrast to living my own life, doing my own thing living my own way. I've decided to follow Jesus. I realize most of us decided a long, long time to follow Jesus. But are you following him moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day? Or is it just when you come to church on Sunday? This is a prayer song. This is a prayer of invitation. Let's stand as we sing.
as we draw closer day by day by day, each one of us drawing closer to the end of our life. Lord, keep us from getting lazy. Keep us from getting comfortable. Keep us from getting satisfied. Don't let us quit living for Jesus. God, if anything, as the, the, the closer we get to the end of our lives, the closer we ought to draw to you. The more people ought to be able to see Jesus in our lives, hear Jesus in our voices. God, increase our decision. Increase our commitment. Increase our desire to walk with you moment by moment the closer we get to coming home to be with you. Thank you for meeting with us this morning, God. Thank you for speaking again to my heart. Thank you for convicting me. God, as we go home, would you allow us to shine Jesus for your glory and your glory alone. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I love you. Thanks for coming this morning. Good day,